In this series of videos, I'll be talking about the nerve supply to the lower limb. Now this is something that caused me no end of confusion when I was a student, and sometimes as a lecturer. But I'm hoping that by running through everything from key concepts to clinical application, I can help you make sense of it. I'd like to start by looking at the theory of nerves, plexuses, and peripheral nerves. And if this doesn't make you shuffle to the edge of your feet in anticipation, that's fair enough. But if you can get a handle on these core concepts, it provides a fantastic foundation for learning everything else. First, I'd like to start with a simple overview. On the left, we'll just draw two nerve roots. These are named after the level they leave the spinal cord, with a letter for the region and a number for the level. For example, C6 or L3. And I'm going to name these NR1 and NR2 after two of the best postcodes. On the other side, we need to add our structures. Now these could be muscle, skin, whatever you want, but I'm just going to draw them as circles A and B. In this scenario, both nerve roots will send fibres to structures A and B. So fibre from NR1 will run along here, whilst fibre from NR2 will be found here and here. Now this drawing is pretty simple, but demonstrates some key concepts of the nerve supply to the limbs. First, it starts with nerve roots leaving the spinal cord. Next, fibres from these roots will separate, cross over, and reorganise themselves, forming a structure known as a plexus. Finally, leaving the plexus are new groups of fibres that are basically travelling in the same direction. These get bundled together to form peripheral nerves, and these are the named nerves such as the femoral or sciatic that you find travelling throughout the limb. Peripheral nerves generally contain fibres from multiple nerve roots. This is a handy backup. If one nerve root gets injured, the nerve may be weakened, but should still receive innovation from the other nerve roots. Similarly, a single nerve root tends to supply multiple peripheral nerves. If that nerve root gets injured, then every nerve it supplies will be affected. If that all makes sense, let's build on that picture by looking at the sensory and motor supply of those nerves. Again, on the left, we'll start with just two nerve roots. But on the right, we need to add more details. First, let's draw a rectangle of skin just here. Above this, we'll have a muscle compartment that contains two small muscles. And below this, a muscle compartment that contains one large muscle. Both nerve roots are trying to send motor fibres to each compartment, as well as receiving sensory innovation from the skin. Fibres from NR1 head out to supply this muscle, and the proximal end of this muscle. We'll then have sensory fibres returning from this portion of the skin. NR2 innovates this muscle and the distal end of our large muscle. It also receives sensory fibres from the rest of the skin. So, what can we see in this illustration? Well, again, it starts with nerve roots that form a plexus. From here, we have a bundle of fibres that form peripheral nerves, which go on to innovate the muscles and the skin of the limb. Now, as a side note, I'll be talking about these a bit more in this section, so I'm going to name those peripheral nerves. Let's go for the avuncular nerve above and the doctrinal nerve below. Now with this illustration, we can look in more detail at the relationship between nerve roots and peripheral nerves. For example, each nerve root supplies a specific area of skin. This is known as the dermatome. If we follow their respective fibres, we can see the dermatome for NR1 is here, whilst the NR2 dermatome will be on this side. However, sensation in the peripheral nerves have a different pattern. If you follow their sensory fibres, then the avuncular nerve supplies the upper portion of the skin, and the doctrinal nerve supplies the lower portion. So why don't these sensory supplies match up? Well, this happens when peripheral nerves contain sensory fibres from multiple nerve roots. This means the area of skin they supply will be a part of multiple dermatomes. Sensation in a peripheral nerve will only match a dermatome if it contains every sensory fibre from a single nerve root. What about the motor supply? Well, the muscles or parts thereof that are innervated by a single nerve root are known as the myotome. If two nerve roots supply one muscle, 
then that muffle will be a part of both myotomes. In this case, the NR1 myotome consists of this muffle in the anterior compartment and the large muffle in the posterior compartment. The NR2 myotome consists of the other muffle in the anterior compartment, but shares this muffle in the posterior compartment. And this is a fairly common pattern for myotomes. A single nerve root supplies muscles across several compartments. Although there can be exceptions, peripheral nerves are generally matched to compartments. So here we can see all of the motor fibres to the anterior compartment are found in the avuncular nerve, whereas the doctrinal nerve contains the motor innervation to the posterior compartment. Clinically, these differences can be a useful diagnostic tool. If a patient damages a nerve root, they may experience muscle weakness across a number of different compartments. If a peripheral nerve is damaged, then a patient can suffer a complete loss of function within a compartment. However, the symptoms are often limited to just that compartment. So, that is all the theory I'd like to run through for now. If you've made it this far, congratulations, breathe out, grab a cup of tea, and in the next video, we'll start applying this theory to the nerves in the lower limb. If you have any questions, please do get in touch. But otherwise, take care, look after yourself, and I'll see you soon. Cheers.